<laughs> oh, hi there. Pardon me, I didn't see you. I just set up all this filming equipment for nothing. Today, we're gonna be learning about the Stuxnet attack, about how that might have been one of the very first nation on nation cyber attacks. I'm just gonna swap this literature for this digital literature. And by the way, if you like this kind of story time setting, like this video, it'll let me know and maybe I'll come out with another one. Well, to start, it all starts a long, long time ago in a desert far, far away. In other words, 2008 in Iran. You see, there was once a nuclear power plant called the Natanz Nuclear Facility, and the US and Israel believed that Iran was enriching uranium past the civilian threshold. Wow, what? Slow down. Well, you see, Iran had agreed prior to this moment to not enrich uranium past the civilian threshold, meaning that they would only use uranium for civilian purposes and not for military purposes. Well, the belief that they were enriching uranium past the civilian level of enrichment indicated that they intended to use the uranium for military use. What civilian use, you might ask? Well, it's power and electricity. What's military use? Well, it's thermonuclear weapons. So why would Israel or the US care about Iran enriching uranium to that point? Well, this. Needless to say, the US and Israel had discovered a potential breach and their treaty with Iran, and they needed to take action in some way. And that is when things get a little spicy, or should I say, cyber spicy. That's not gonna be a thing. Intro, Stuxnet. Now officially, it's still unknown who deployed Stuxnet. It's believed to have been either the US or Israel, but really, the jury's still technically out on that one. We've already talked a little bit whenever we talked about solar winds, about how attribution can be a tricky thing, and, well, case in point, Stuxnet. You see, Stuxnet was malware that was designed for the Natanz nuclear facility, or more specifically, the Siemens SCADA systems that Natanz relied on. You see, Siemens is a company, and the Natanz was using SCADA systems that Siemens provided. If you need to know what SCADA systems are, here's a video. Now, how did Stuxnet make it onto SCADA systems? Well, if you just watched that video, then you are probably thinking, but StudioSec man, whoever you are. You said that SCADA systems are probably gonna be air-gapped. So how do they put Stuxnet on a SCADA system? Well, that's absolutely true, and it's believed that it was delivered through some kind of medium like USB. Again, the details on that get a little fuzzy the more you try to detail down, but it's universally believed that it was some sort of physical media that transported Stuxnet onto the SCADA system that was in Natanz. Once it had infected its first computer, it would ask that device if it was a SCADA system and if it was connected to critical infrastructure or an industrial control system. Now, if a system kind of gave a yes answer in its reply, then, then Stuxnet would create a clone of itself, pass the clone off to the next system down the line on the network, and then it would basically continue to sit and watch that computer. Now, for all the computers that it infected, it recorded for some degree of time, it could have been weeks, it could have been months, but it recorded normal operating procedure on those devices. So it recorded what a normal day looks like. What, what do the screens look like? What do you know centrifuges do in a normal day? And what kind of, you know, what kind of metrics are the engineers and analysts expecting on a normal day at the Natanz nuclear facility? And over that time, it collected that data, it recorded, and so whenever it decided to start executing its payload, it did something pretty neat. Neat if you're a nerd. Once, after a few weeks or months after it was infected, crap hit the fan. Stuxnet woke up. It started with Stuxnet spinning up centrifuges much faster than they're supposed to spin and then slowing them down much slower than they're supposed to spin, but in close succession to one another. This created physical wear and tear on the centrifuges that were not designed to go through that kind of spin up and spin down cycle. Now, why this is particularly cool if you're a nerd is if you were an engineer at the analyst and you're looking at the screen, everything looks normal. You see, during the weeks to months leading up to Stuxnet deploying its payload, it was recording normal operating procedure, as we said. Well, whenever it started deploying the payload and spinning centrifuges up and down, it, di it displayed on the systems normal operating procedures. So if you're an analyst and you're looking at the screen or you're an engineer, 
you're seeing that, well, really, it looks like just another day, but you can clearly tell that something is wrong with these centrifuges because they're spinning up, they're spinning down, they are physically degrading right in front of your eyes. Well, you see, over a not so long period of time, this caused so much wear and tear in the Natanz nuclear facility that it's estimated that up to a third of Iran's nuclear centrifuges were destroyed due to this malware. Eventually, a lot of these facilities had to be shut down for a temporary amount of time to prevent some sort of meltdown. Now, the worst part is that it's believed that Stuxnet played Thunderstruck by ACDC on the Natanz PA system. That's hit some home. So you're probably thinking that's pretty bad and pretty serious. So what happened next? Well, Iran was able to wipe Stuxnet from their network. Unfortunately, Stuxnet was able to jump onto other systems. There was a breakout of Stuxnet. It was able to jump to countries like India, Pakistan. There was even an attempt to deploy Stuxnet into North Korea, allegedly. Uh, but well, none of those really had the kind of impact that, it, that Stuxnet had had already at the Natanz nuclear facility. Today, tensions remain high, and Iran is not believed officially to have any kind of nuclear weapons. So if the goal of Stuxnet was to delay Iran from getting any kind of nuclear weapons, then it probably succeeded. I mean, they still don't have nuclear weapons and we're about 12 years after the deployment of Stuxnet. Now, if it was designed to keep them permanently from being able to make nuclear weapons, well, the jury is out on that one. Now, does this cyber attack count as a cyber war? And well, no, it's a cyber attack. And as we've said about attribution, we really don't know really who deployed Stuxnet. We sure know who the victim was in this attack and that would be Iran and more specifically Iran's nuclear industry. However, we don't know who the official uh, attacker was. It could be, you know, the US or Israel. It could be anyone else. It, you really, it, you don't, who knows? For something to be a cyber war, there would have to be a fire back. There would have to be two clear sides. And there would also have to be other attacks. This was one singular attack. Uh, there have not been any other cyber attacks that have been a direct response to Stuxnet, at least not officially. And so, no, it doesn't really count as being a cyber war. It's really just a cyber attack that happened. Now, could a cyber war look like this? Potentially. But you would clearly know who the aggressors would be in a cyber war. You would know who the attacker, who the defenders would be. And who knows? I mean, maybe it would impact nuclear industries in either country. So. Where do we go from here, kids? Well, eat your veggies, listen to your parents, do your homework, don't get stuck snap. Don't, don't get stuck snap. See you next time.